This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And today's guest is Josh Malaman. We are wrapping up a huge three-part conversation. As always, listen to them in any order. So you can go back to 359 and 360 for great insights into Josh's latest novel, Mallory. We talk about returning to Bird Box. We talk about film and TV adaptations. But by all means, listen to this one first. And then go back when you're done. And what is on the agenda today with Josh? The New York Times bestseller of books such as Bird Box and A House at the Bottom of a Lake. Well, let me tell you. We kick off talking about his interest in buying Fangoria. So how did that come about? How did it work out? Well, you're going to find out. We also talk a little bit about his writing habits and the process. So what does writing look like for Josh Malaman? And we talk about his production company with Ryan Lewis. And hey, get into a little bit more. We have some bizarre Patreon questions. Things like how many horror books can you balance on your head? And who will play you in a biopic? So all of that coming up. But before any of it, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection. Three hugely popular novels in one box set. The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned, together in one terrifying volume. Available in ebook and paperback, and a high-quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. Do you like The Twilight Zone? What about Tales from the Crypt? Or perhaps Black Mirror? Well, we got you covered. The Other Stories is a weekly short story podcast. We've got sci-fi, horror, thriller and weird stories delivered right to your podcast feed every Monday morning. So find us on your favourite podcast app or go to acast.com forward slash the other stories. And remember, these aren't the stories your mother used to tell you. These are the other stories. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is the third and final part of the conversation with Josh Malaman. I wanted to ask about... A tweet that you put out a few weeks back now about the fact that you would be interested in buying Fangoria. So I'm wondering, is this like a legitimate interest? Is this something where you've actually made inquiries? Because I know that Fangoria are in some trouble at the moment. I mean, with their parent company... Sinistate and some accusations and some evidence that has come to light. So I think they may be looking for a new buyer. So is this something you are actively making inquiries about? I did. I wrote. I spoke to um, uh, a member of the, the staff there. Now you know. Um, after that tweet, um, and that conversation went well. And then I wrote. The owner, Dallas, I wrote him an email um, expressing my interest and we got on the phone and had like, you know, typically in my business uh, conversations, Ryan Lewis is always present, like like every single time. But this was just something I was just, I don't know, inspired to look into on my own and I talked to him on my own and it was a good business 
discussion and and I actually kind of learned a lot in that talk to be honest with you um and and like my, I gotta be honest with you the wh what is up for sale is just like so incredible I mean it's Fangoria man it's uh, mm -hmm. uh god it's it's the whole thing it's the magazine the backlog the letters to Fangoria like literally like the whole history of Fangoria is like all included and I mean holy cow right and mm -hmm. I got like the price from him and I found out that there's there were 22 other people interested uh 20 other 22 other prospective buyers. I think it's something that I would I think it's something I would do really well to be honest with you. I don't know why, but I think it is. But then I was talking to Ryan and I was talking to Allison about it and it kind of came down to like you don't want to play in the league and own a team you don't you don't want to like play in the nba and own the team you want to like you're you're playing right now in the league you know like like you don't want to own fangoria you want to be reviewed by fangoria and you want to do interviews you know what i mean like and and i think that ultimately that they were right it's like your heart your passion is writing books do you really want to like run a freaking magazine right now um and i understand that you could be a somewhat silent owner and that other people could uh, carry on and it would probably carry on without um, a hitch exactly as it is right now with just changing ownership hands but I'm just not really that kind of guy I'm not like a silent uh, owner kind of guy so I imagine that I would have you know it, by buying Fangoria I think that I would have been devoting time to something that I don't think in the long run would have been wise right now so I eventually wrote him um, thanks for the talk uh, I actually learned a lot in that talk, and but and I t I gave this the silly sports example to him too, and said my you know my, my passion lies in in writing books, and I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna stay there. And he wrote back, totally understandable. Hope our paths cross down the road, and, and that and that was it. Yeah, yeah. But I <laughs> looked into it, and and there was a moment of like, are you gonna do this? Are you gonna freaking buy Fangoria magazine? You know, like I, and I just. You know, if if I if I was the kind of guy like T. D. Klein, where I was writing once every in a while, then I, I think I would have done it. Um, yeah, but I'm, yeah. I'm just like that kind of guy though. So, so mm -hmm. it was like, you know what? No, but I'm but I'm glad I looked into it. Yeah, yeah, and I know what you mean because I've juggled a lot of different things too, like the publishing, the podcasting, writing, editing teaching and I mean this is why I always say you can do anything you want but you can't do everything and if you're doing one thing like let's say running Fangoria while it what what it's going to be taken away from time that you have for other pursuits so you kind of have to prioritize and decide what is it that you want to be doing and focusing on right now and of course in in a different season of your life that might change but yeah i mean if the writing is what you're most interested in now and obviously you've got the film production company too then perhaps taking on uh, fangoria it, it is just not in terms of of time gonna gonna work out but I also relate in the sense that I get very, very excited about things and think, oh, yeah, this is a project that I definitely want to take on. And I, I do that in in every facet of my life. I mean, even now that I'm teaching, it's like, oh, I could look at like some promotional opportunities and go into to management or a more supervisor role. And it's like, whoa hang on a fucking minute because literally you've spent the last few years of your life just doing self-employed work you're finding it a struggle to to be doing this full time but with generous holiday if you take a senior role then you can kiss by that that free time so basically mm -hmm. slow down but i i just think one of my problems is everything i do i want to do it to the best of my ability and I mean, te teaching as the example, that is just meant to be a job for me. That is a way to get me a little bit more money. It makes the visa to be in Japan a lot easier. So it's like, just just be a regular teacher. Because if I 
then get a senior role, it's like, well, well done. Now you've taken away the time that you had for the writing and the podcasting, which was what it was all about anyway. So, yeah, I, I relate to everything you're saying. Yeah, and, it, and it's like Allison and I already have full days. And, like, even, um, even lunch with a friend means and and that's that's wonderful i i want to have that all the time but lunch with a friend means one of those other things you normally do in the day josh is not going to get done it's just not so now imagine throwing in a magazine and not just a magazine but like fangoria like one of like the like the hallmark legends of horror magazine right Mm -hmm. so so it was like oh man And and you know it's obviously something like that is a lot of money, and I, I believe I could have made it happen. Um, but it, I, yeah, it's it's exactly what you're saying that once you take on a project, you want to do it right, and you want to. And I, I just foresaw this like moment of like a year down the road of like, oh shit, man, that's the least I've written in a year, you know, like in in ever. Yeah. And that was sort of like the final. And Ryan and Allison are the ones that like pointed that out to me they're like this is sounds really fun and amazing but you love writing books dude it was like it was like you know like that's gonna get in the way of that okay oh yeah 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 yeah. you're right you're right okay fine yeah i think i guess what's what's good is there's like 20 something other people yeah that yeah that are interested so there's a huge possibility that that fangoria will continue yes um but you know that's hopefully that's that's a hopeful you know yeah i do think that i'm the only lunatic author that called <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but the rest, i don't know that for sure but yeah but i have a feeling that the rest were probably probably business men and women and and i uh that was, you know i'm a little nervous for that call guys you know because Again, Ryan's always there with me, and I'm just like a weirdo in my office, you know. And then like, and I'm like, all right, we're going to talk business now. That's those sound those numbers sound reasonable, you know. Yeah. And but I discovered that <laughs> how it was actually a very fluid, um, human, um, uh, informative conversation. I walked away from it feeling like I'm glad I checked into it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a good job since you didn't have Ryan there that you didn't walk away and ring up Ryan and you're like, so the conversation went well. I now own Fangoria. <laughs> like you know, you didn't just like take it to that level. It's like I've now, I've now kind of bought it off the back of that phone call. <laughs> hey Ryan, I mortgaged mine and your homes. Yeah, uh, well we own a magazine now. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, that would have been crazy. Oh, Dan, but don't worry. Freddie Fat Fingers said he's a fan of mine. Like, dude, <laughs> like, we're going to be great, man. Don't worry that the mafia is involved. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I even understood your, your example when you were talking about, you know, if you have lunch with a friend, and that's practically a, a day out the window and that's something that I find as a creative that can be tricky to balance because of course you not only want a social life but it's going to be important for your mental health I mean we are social creatures and social beings but I also have to be disciplined if I want to get all these creative projects done especially yep. now that I'm teaching again so I mean An example would be this weekend, I was kind of invited to do something for for the entire day and I was very tempted, but I said, well, rather than have like a kind of whole day event, why don't we just catch up over coffee? Because that that feels at at the time that it is now more, more proportionate in terms of the time that I can spare if I want to get all these things done. And, and I do, and yep. I want to get paper ritual sent to the editor, which we're very, very close to, to doing now. And then I want to send it to Ryan. So let, let's see if we can have more interest in, 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 in turning more of my work and now Bob's work into a movie. But let's jump into some 
some Patreon questions, which are varying in their seriousness, because we have people like Rena Mason, but also we have people like Max Booth asking questions. So <laughs> <laughs> let's jump in with one from Michael Sellers. And he says, I'd love to hear a little about your process and writing habits. I mean, I, I imagine over the, the years and conversations that we've covered a hell of a lot of that. I know we've covered quite a bit in this conversation, but anything else that you'd like to divulge or talk about? You know, I, I, I'm discovering that they vary per project, right? And how you were just talking about discipline, right? Well, now you can see the beauty of, um, well, you could anyway, probably, but you can understand the beauty of Carpenter's Farm and locking yourself into, you have to write this every day because you said you would, right? I'm I'm seeing sort of like patterns, like certain, like that, that alien book. Um, I want to write that one at night. Why? I don't know. I want the darkness outside. I want the stars out when I work on that. Um, but what that means is when I say that is that I'll probably do like two to 3000 words a day um, for the duration from every day, except maybe one or two days off maybe until that rough draft is done. And then it'll, it'll happen typically around the same time at night. Other books like Bird Box, for some reason, started at eight in the morning and went till noon every day. And that was without a break for 26 days. Mallory was, I think, also morning. Um, so it's it, it's not like there's a, a specific time of day, but per book there is, and I think that that's, I think that's um, what's the right word? Healthy, fun for like an artist to like. It doesn't have to be eight to noon every day. You can you could try like a two a.m. novel. Let's see what comes out of that. You could try. Um, I <clears throat> had read or spoken to Paul Tremblay that he wrote like 500 words a day or something like that. And I'm like more of a, like Bird Box was 4,300. Unburied Carol was 5,300 a day. And, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a book like with Paul's method. I'm going to do it. And I, I, I hung out with him at a convention and told him about this in LA and everything. I'm like, I'm going to try your way on one. Let's just see what happens. And it was grueling. Like, to only do 500 a day, but and I had to stop, you know, not in mid-sentence, right? But I had to stop and and walk away. And only you know, I was only allowed 500 a day. It was freaking grueling. And it's probably the messiest freaking book I've ever written. So you would think that, you know, that process would slow you down and, and make me really careful. And I'm sure that does work for Paul. Obviously, it does. But for me, it felt like I was like, like my dogs, like, like, like begging to be let outside the whole time, you know? And, but I did do it. So, uh, and then there was another one. Um, I wrote a, a huge one, an 1100 pager, 300,000 words. Mm, God, what a number, what a gorgeous writing number, 300,000 words. And with that one, I, I only allowed myself a thousand a day because I understood I was running a marathon, like to, to come out at, four or five K a day, you're going to run out of gas, you know, and then you may not finish the book, but something like a thousand a day for me was a good middle ground. You know, you're still getting something done. You have time. It's not as much time as you normally would spend, but you will probably be able to maintain this for 300 days. And I did. So it, it's, it's been project by project. The next one I assume will be um, because I had seen a post by Lansdale and I think we talked about this last time we talked that um, he said that he has one working draft the whole time. And, and I made, I was very intentional with uh, the second version of Mallory and Carpenter's farm also, also in that wrote a chapter, rewrote it, wrote the next one, rewrote it and then read kind of up to there you know, then, you know, so you're constantly um, in rhythm with the story. You're editing as you go. You, uh, you're not, you know, when you, I've written rough drafts where like a character suddenly springs up halfway and I'm like, who the hell is Steve? You know? And like, <laughs> you know, because it's 
Like, I was moving so fucking fast and not even paying attention. And then, like, or, like, names change halfway. Like, totally sister. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, what the, what? And, and, I, and then, so, I do think that Lansdale method is, like, working for me. Because I think Mallory and Carpenter's Farm worked out well. So, I'm going to try to stick to the Lansdale method for the next, for the next one. I assume that if it's the alien one, that would be at night and it would be like, yeah, like two to three a day until it's done. The rewrite process, I mean, I don't even know. I'm one of those guys who like, I just, that word, like, oh, I dread it, you know, because I'm all feel, man. I'm all feel. It's like, a, like, I, I, like, I like to jam and I like to like, let's roll, let's roll. And rewrite is so focused. But I also understand that that's where the real that's where the real good shit comes in. I get it. So, but there's no like, I don't like, you know, I rewrite 10 pages a day or I rewrite for four hours. It's not like that. It's the rewrites are more like whatever I can get done today and then whatever I can get done tomorrow. And, but also every day until it's done. So to answer that question, I think it varies, but the one constant is work on it every day until that phase of the project is done is how I do it. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd have to think that at 500 words a day, at 500 words a day, like Paul does, and everybody's different, but I have a feeling for you, you couldn't reach that Zen moment. That right. Zen, you know what I'm talking about? Because you, you're, right. you, you, me and you write the same way. I love the creative process. It's the rewriting, which you, you're, you're just taking, you're polishing at that point, but that creative that creation moment, oh, I gotta yeah. have it. It's a trance, man. Like I dance with horror stories, you know? I, I dance with and to horror stories in this office. There's an invisible drummer in this office. It's so glorious. Soundtracks playing, this and that. And that Paul method, I, mean, I can tell in his books how, how deliberate and focused he is and it's freaking brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, it did not work for me, man. But then I told him, I'm like, now you got to do it at 4,000 a day. And he's like, well, screw you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what I, I did say that to him, but I don't remember what he said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is why we always say with writing advice, you know, your mileage may vary. And that's it. It's writing advice. You take what works, you discard yeah. what doesn't. You add what's you uniquely your own, as Bruce Lee said. Not you know, another cool thing, that Lansdale thing was just a post on Facebook. And like, and again, I, you know, we're always talking about how dismal uh, Twitter and Facebook are. And my God, can't they be right? But, but another, just like Harbiner's Farm and, and the communal sort of art that uh, happened on that one, that I just saw a Lansdale post that maybe has changed my writing life. Like, that's cool. And and, and I haven't met Joe Lansdale yet. Um, my God, I would love to. And I'd love to just hang out with him and, and drink and talk about this stuff. But he's one of my favorite online. There's just a real, kind of like how he writes, a real straight, just like, this is how it is. And this is, what I, this is how I do it. And you just, you just trust him. I don't know what it is. You just trust that dude. And... Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that post and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try a book like you. I'm gonna try the book the way you do it. And it worked. And so, yeah, yeah, there's that. Yeah, I'd love to see a Lansdale short story adapted into a film via your production company. I think that would be a wonderful collaboration. Oh man, uh, yeah, you're right. I, so I read um, by Bizarre Hands, which was amazing. Mm. Do you, um, do you have another Lansdale like collection in mind that I, I should that Ryan and I should check out right away? Ooh, there's a good... so many. Yeah, I know that. Um, the, got... you know, probably the the go to one is is and there's probably some overlap would be you know just to his collected short stories. Uh, and I can't think. I don't think it has an actual name. I think it's just like a fancy title or something. Okay. Okay. Right, I'll check it out. Or, or it's Bob. got Godzilla's twelve-step program in there, which is fucking hilarious. 
And uh, I'm just trying to find the collection with the night they missed the horror show. Which one's that? Yeah, Captain by Bizarre Hands. I read that. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, damn, that would I, be I, the one. Yeah, I feel <laughs> like you can't go wrong. Like I haven't picked up a collection by Lansdale that was a dud. So right. you know, no, just, just yeah, put it on yeah, random. Just, <laughs> you know, he's an interesting guy too because he's also had like. Not only like you know, like he's had big movies made from his stuff and like like beloved like adaptations and and he I, I he I saw him post something about like a lot of his stuff like the bottoms I know was um was like near to getting started or something right mm-hmm. and I don't know where that is now and but I mean all it takes is me writing the dude right I mean that's how this life works right if I if Ryan and I are interested in and Joe, I should freaking just write him and tell him so and, and take it from there. And so maybe this conversation will make that happen, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bill well, Paxton I, was... I did selfishly hope that in, in implanting that idea that a conversation might occur. So, yeah, I'm all for it. <laughs> I mean, I think with the bottoms that, uh, that Bill Paxton was involved with that b- before he passed away. Yeah. And uh, Joe and, and Bill were really, really close. And I think that that project and that particular iteration of that project died with that. But I think the thicket is still in the works okay. with, uh, with Peter Dinklage. So, wow, really? and, and yeah, I know which the Happen Leonard show and mm-hmm. yeah, Joe is amazing, dude. Man, he is. Oof. He's good. Um, all right. So let's, uh, okay. So another Patreon question. Lucas Mill Iron says, are you still playing music? Yeah, but that's been really hard um, in terms of the lockdown. Like we were talking about like practicing together online with Ethernet and all that stuff. But it's like we were in the midst of um recording pretty much two albums one we had all the music down for and we were starting to sing and the other one was i don't i don't even know what the difference between the two albums really are except one is being produced by the bass player and one is being produced by the guitar player steven so chad and steven and then um and then the lockdown happened and we haven't no, not much has happened in 100 days, but we write each other because we're, we're all like best friends and have been best friends since we were like kids, you know. So we're all in like a thread together and and we all um, every day we're like, ah, I want to be recording, you know, because we were like right there. We were, du- we were laying vocals down and stuff. And so the answer is yes, but the lockdown is, has, has put a monkey wrench into that. But OK, we'll get to it when we get to the other side of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been interesting to see how different musicians have handled the lockdown. And I mean, we've seen some artists like Devin Townsend and Leprous and Post Malone put on effectively like live gigs from from their homes. And we also saw Metallica do a, a Zoom call and do a acoustic or or a garage version of blacken so it is it again it's like forcing people to be more creative and to experiment with new ideas and i mean i think as well we'll see within the fiction community i think we will see more like live zoom events to launch books i mean it's a great idea video and audio a great medium so why not i think this forced creativity will mean that that there are good things and good things that stick around hey don't forget like all those theatrical readings that i've been talking about us doing for years the only people that see that are the people that are in the room yeah so like you're saying like instead of me feeling like ah this was canceled i should be like dude all right oh instead you can literally put on a show for the whole horror scene i mean if if, if anyone watched or cared you know what i'm saying like you can like do that like let's roll let's do it so yeah it really is it goes back to the very first thing you were talking about you know perspective and am i going to be um progressive about this scenario or am i going to be like 
fuck and just like sit you know pout for for a month yeah and and like you said as well i mean just because you can't do the the detroit zoo and the, the train event now it doesn't mean that you never can so you get to do a cool online launch event now and you get to do what was originally planned later you get right. both. Yep. <laughs> You've won. Yep. yep, totally agree. Totally, totally, totally agree. We're talking of online events. Thea Maeve would like to know, did Jonathan Janza's performance at CoronaCon win him the job to narrate the audiobook for Mallory? Oh, my God. Did you guys see that? Bob, you saw it, right? Bob? Or no? Bob, oh yeah! I thought oh, yeah. we lost you, Bob. <laughs> Did you both? No, I didn't realize I. There, I've got some extraneous noise outside, so I've had my mic muted. Uh, it's like there's people outside. There shouldn't be. But anyway, uh, apartment life. But yes, yes, I did catch that, and uh, that it was so very good. cool. It was just like such a shock, too. Like not not. I mean, I don't know why, but it just was. Like I just didn't know that about him. Like that he's really, really good at reading his freaking books. Like he um, did all like the character voices and the passion in their voices. And it was like, you could see in the comment section, all of us getting like, like at first it's like, whoa, hey, whoa, damn, this is good. And by the end it's like, bravo, you know? <laughs> and, and to answer that question, hell yes, I would want Jonathan Jans to read one of these books. Mallory, no. Because Mallory's being read um, already by um, uh, Cassandra Campbell, who did Bird Box. And I love that she's doing this book also. I love that it's the same narrator. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, a different book with John? Yeah, man. I would for sure love that. All right. Now, I guess we've probably covered Rena Mason's question, but... She said, will there be a Malaman production company in the near future? And I feel we, we've covered that with Spinner Black Yarn with Ryan but Lewis. You know what? It, it is a great, it's a, okay, it's a good question though too still because Ryan and I talk about this like, and when we talk to people, maybe Ryan spoke to you this way too, like we're just like, Bird Box was a gigantic hit, but we were and we obviously we were involved but that wasn't our production company right so in some ways like ryan and i are just like still starting this you know like bird box the movie came out like i mean almost you know it came out at the very end of nine of 18 so like it was really gained steam in january of 19. i mean it wasn't that long ago when this happened right so ryan and i are like still like trying to make things happen and when 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 we talk to um, you know, writers like you and and Max and everyone, we, we kind of like tell them like, you know, we don't, you know, we haven't pulled anything major off yet ourselves, but like we're trying and we're and we're getting, you know, we got um, traction on numerous things. So to, so in a sense, to answer Rena's question, like who, by the way, I love Rena Mason and hello to her. Um, like there's like to answer a question, like yes, it exists. But the real question becomes like, are you know, are you know, when, how do you explain that? Like, are you guys going to be making movies? Well, we're trying, right? We're trying, and mm-hmm. and we really are, and we're trying to do it in the right way, where it's writer, creator first, um, and is involved in as many steps as they can be along the way, um, uh, more so than what is traditional. Like, I, I didn't mind at all, um, my scant involvement in bird box the movie but at the same time like i think it's kind of awesome that i'm talking regularly about black mad wheel with the producers it's fun it's great so so um we pretty much have been trying to take that 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 um platform that it's ryan i and like and you let's say right like we're like if somebody um you know gets serious and um girl in the videos option we want you him and I to be involved every step of the way. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, what's the right word? That doesn't mean we, we have to breathe down a screenwriter's neck the whole time. It just means just like checking in, having conversations, being a part of it, you know, being a mm-hmm. part of the process or something. So 
uh, literally, technically, yes, Rena, we have started, and but we haven't got where we want it to be yet. But we are just starting out, and and we're busting our asses on it. So yes, yeah, and we're all very excited about it, and we're also excited that we're chatting with Rena Mason in a couple of months. So that's going to be a cool <laughs> podcast conversation mm-hmm. we've got coming up. We're we're doing yeah, that one in a- August. I want to hear that one because, like, yeah, she's just, like, she's been so involved in not just the writing side but the organization side and the and the horror community side. You know, I would love to to hear that, that yeah, one when you guys yeah. do. Awesome. Mm. We've got a number of questions from Patrick R. Macadono. And apologies, Patrick, if I'm mispronouncing your surname, as that's the first time I've tried to <laughs> say it aloud. Um, some of these are bizarre questions. First one, how many horror books can you balance on your head? Do you have any idea why he's asking that? <laughs> oh, um, okay, I love that fucking question. I... And because I'm literally looking at a giant stack of them, and I think I'm going to get one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and eleven. Uh, I want to do the whole stack. I think I think I'm going to say, dude, and I'm going to try to prove this with a photo eventually. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to say twenty twenty. There you go, Patrick. So <laughs> twenty. You use the ceremonies as the anchor, then you probably did. Yeah. Right. It's all about the pyramid. <laughs> 20 books and if if you manage to do that and and get the photo then send it to me it might even be the main photo for this episode so that'd be cool i'm gonna try it all i need is one second and allison's got to capture it you know that's all i need yeah so I, I'm, I'm gonna give it a whirl i could also cheat and use this one uh top hat i have that has a flat surface on top but i don't think that's what he means no no <laughs> 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 and hi Patrick. I just I met Patrick recently and he's a I I love him online. I, I, I that sounds like a funny thing to say. I love him online, you know, as if you don't otherwise, but I only know him online. Um and I met him recently, so hello Patrick. Yeah. How did you meet him? <clears throat> um what did he he tweeted something that I thought was really cool and then somehow we started talking about the house of the head on um in like personal messages and then now we're facebook friends too he's just he just he's just like a positive force online um mm-hmm. and i look for that you know in in tweeters for yeah trying out that word um i look for that i mean i'm you know i'm just as fired up and and raged out about this you know government and presidency as the next guy and so I look for people online who are like being more just, I don't know, you know, positivity, whatever. And he, and he's got that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you there. And I mean, Patrick, mm-hmm. someone, I, I think it was either this or late last year that I started speaking to. And I know he's recently started his own podcast as well. And he seems yeah. to be a really big champion for the genre. And the other guy, yeah who's really championing the genre, who who seemingly came out of nowhere, is Glenn Parker with his podcast, Does the Dog Die in This? So those are, are two people. I knew, were, I, I knew who you were going to say. I even knew who you were going to say, like, because it does seem like came out of nowhere and totally with, like, the right spirit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So th- those are two positive dudes who people should seek out particularly if you want more conversations like this because they've you know they've both got their their podcasts and they're, they're both genuinely decent people and well that's what we want more of yeah mm-hmm. well patrick also wants to know when they make a biopic about you who will play you and who will play sandra bullock <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, and you could definitely use this photo. I want Allison to play me. And mm-hmm. I don't And I, I, have... I've seen, I've seen the photos. It's pretty mm-hmm. convincing. I want either, yeah. either Allison or like a super like hot Jewish dude. Like, like some like, 
like outrageous where everyone's like that's not what josh looked yeah no. <laughs> and he's like super smooth and like there's like it starts with him like jogging at the beginning and he <laughs> stops like, and he stops and he's like i've got a great idea for a book and then he jogs home and like the dogs meet him and he's like he eats this like you know this shake and he fits them. everything's so bright and wonderful and i want everyone to be like no 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 that's not him that movie sucked but I think that if Allison, I think if Allison did it, it would be perfect, man. And then I, I think she, yeah, she would do it perfectly, man. And she's 10 years younger than me. So so maybe that's something morbid, like if I die and then she reaches that age or something, I don't know, whatever. Um, but Allison as me, and I will send that photo. And Sandra Bullock, I think she should play herself. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> See, so this conversation will be going out in two or two or three parts, probably three parts at this point. And mm -hmm. of course, we can't have the cover picture, both Alison as you and you balancing books on your head. But I'm thinking it would be really funny and weird if for either the first or the second part, we have a picture of Alison as you in the cover photo, and we, we don't even acknowledge it. We just wait to see who comments, <laughs> and it's like, hang on a minute. Yeah, I, have, <laughs> I have like a bunch of them. There's the one that I posted of um, her like trying to kiss me, but there's like a whole series. There's like 30 photos from that. I'll send you one of just her. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think yeah, that would be, be pretty great. funny to see who's yeah. like, wait a minute. Is that just really especially because I take it grayscale, so it obscures it a little bit. <laughs> oh my god! Everyone's gonna be like, "Mallerman lost some weight." Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, Mallerman look, has really. I never noticed that Mallerman has pretty eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm finding myself attracted to Malaman in ways that I never knew were possible, but I like that feeling and I don't want it to stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's He's gonna... got... yeah. 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 Well, now I've said yeah. that at some point, someone might take that audio bite and mix it into something to take me out of context. Just talking about how how attracted I am to you. Well. Well, whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can do that. <laughs> well, finally, Patrick wants to know what your go-to snack is. And then he says, is it cheese and crackers? I think it's cheese and crackers. What kind of cheese? So that, that's very presumptuous and confident, Patrick. So what is your go-to snack? Um, man, I, I don't know. I don't know if I I don't know if I have a snack. Yeah. I don't really have like a snack or something. A snack? Something that sounds like the weirdest thing in the world to have a snack. Like what does that even mean? Like like what's that what, 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 what do you have a snack? Like what's your go-to snack? What's my snack? Um You have I know, like, I, I try to make a point of eating regular meals, you know, so that I don't have to snack in between. So I'm probably the worst person to ask about a go-to snack. <laughs> like, I don't really love chips so much. I'm not, I don't really have a sweet tooth. Allison always tells me I'm sort of like a bland eater. Um, right. <laughs> I, I don't really, I don't put salt and pepper on shit. I've, 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 food to me has always been fuel. Yeah. And it's, it's like... Uh, okay, we got uh, this piece of bread and some marinara sauce. All right, done. I'm done. Let's right. Let's roll. Let's talk, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah, Patrick, I will tell you this. I eat, I probably eat too many eggs. But that that's a weird snack, though, to just eat eggs. <laughs> yeah. I suppose the nearest thing that I have to a snack is I do quite like very dark chocolate. But we're talking over 80% cacao, preferably 90%. So... That's uh, about as near as it gets to a snack. If there was a bunch of cookies around the house, I'd eat them, you know. But I don't. <laughs> I don't really. Uh, yeah, sorry, Patrick. I get kind of a letdown on that one. Huh? I don't really have a snack. Yeah. yeah. I love cookies. Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I wish. Right. Now, I really wish I had some cookies all of a sudden, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Do you have any final thoughts? I do. I do. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And I hope Mallory thrills everyone. And Bob, thank you again for tweeting about it and what you've said tonight about it. And um, I love you guys. And I love being on the show. And I can't wait to read your book um, that you two wrote. And I just, whatever, we're all on lockdown. Um, like, as, as we started with what Michael said at the very beginning, there is a way to to let it be horrible and positive at the same time in our own daily lives of writing. And I love the horror scene. And and just thanks for everything. And and I hope that, uh, I hope this podcast was informative. I hope it was heavy at times. And I hope that it was weird at the end because there's no doubt. <laughs> and and yeah. that's, uh, and that's it. I just wanted to sign off with sort of a positive, like we'll get through this thing and I love being a part of this whole scene. Yeah, we love you too, man. And this has been yeah. a hell of a lot of fun. This has been amazing. And we look forward <laughs> to doing it again sometime. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror Podcast. Join us again next time for a very special this is horror awards episode yeah that is right we are going to be announcing the winners to the this is horror awards in an episode we've got conversations with most of the winners of the this is horror awards little segments so look forward to that and if you want to find out who's won ahead of the crowd and you want to listen to that episode ahead of the crowd then the only way to do so is to become a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. When you do that, not only are you getting access to each and every episode ahead of the crowd, but you get to submit questions to each and every guest. People like Chuck Paulinick, Adam Caesar, and Jeff Strand. And yeah, that's right, Chuck Paulinick. We are going to be chatting with him in about two weeks' time. And this is monumental because when I started This Is Horror, I wrote a bucket list of who, who would be my dream guests if I could get anyone on the show. And the top three writers that I would love to chat with are Stephen King, Chuck Paulinick, and Haruki Murakami. So... This dream is becoming a reality, and when I got an email from Chuck confirming that he was going to be on the show, I mean, I, I was shaking with adrenaline and with excitement. So, wow, what a moment that's going to be for me personally. If you want to submit a question to Chuck, you can become a patron of This Is Horror Podcast, from as little as one dollar, you get to submit a question to Chuck Paulinick. Or maybe it's a good time to remind you that if you want to advertise on the This Is Horror podcast, reach out to me as well, michael at thisishorror.co.uk. And if you like the show, but you don't want to become a patron, you don't want to advertise, but you do want to support us in some way, just leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. We always appreciate them. They're a good way to let people know that you're enjoying the show. And they help us in terms of our visibility on Apple Podcasts. Okay, before I wrap up, a quick word from our sponsors. Do you like The Twilight Zone? What about Tales from the Crypt? Or perhaps Black Mirror? Well, we got you covered. The Other Stories is a weekly short story podcast. We've got sci-fi, horror, thriller and weird stories delivered right to your podcast feed every Monday morning. So find us on your favourite podcast app or go to acast.com forward slash the other stories. And remember, these aren't the stories your mother used to tell you. These are the other stories. From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection. Three hugely popular novels in one box set. The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned 
together in one terrifying volume, available in ebook and paperback, and a high quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. So last time I wrapped up with a haiku. Nobody has mentioned that or called me out on it. I don't know, do people get called out for ending an episode with a haiku? Whoa, motherfucker, what, what are you doing? You can't... Yeah, well, I can. It happened. Now today, rather than ending with a haiku, I'm going to end with a poem. And I put a call out on Twitter, at Wilson the Writer, asking people to recommend some of their favourite poetry to me. And VR Weather recommended a number of poems by Ossa Beg, and apologies if I've mispronounced that name. And these are so visceral and there's a lot going on particularly in the guinea pig cave which i'd like to read today now i certainly recommend that you do google that it's available freely at 3ammagazine.com because there's an awful lot going on in this poem that you're probably not going to catch the first time round, but this is fantastic. So here it is, In the Guinea Pig Cave by Ossa Beg. There lay the guinea pigs. There lay the guinea pigs, and they waited with blood around their mouths like my sister. There lay the guinea pigs, and they smelled bad in the cave. There lay my sister, and she swelled and ached and throbbed. There lay the guinea pigs, and they ached all over, and their legs stuck straight up like beetles, and they looked depraved and were blue under their eyes as from months of debauchery. My sister puked calmly and indifferently. It ran slowly out of her slack mouth without her moving a single nerve. And the cave was warm as teats and full of autumn leaves, and beneath the soil lay the arm of a mannequin. There lay the guinea pigs and ached and were made of dough. There lay the guinea pigs beside the knives that would slice them up like loaves. And my sister with lips of blueberries, soil and mush. In the distance the siren bleated inhumanly. That is where the guinea pigs lay and waited with blood around their mouths and contorted bodies. They waited. And I was tired in my whole stomach from meat, dough and guinea pig loaf and I knew that they would revenge on me. And that was In the Guinea Pig Cave. I'll see you in the next podcast for the This Is Horror Awards show. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another Read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.